Who was Martin Chemnitz? And how can we be encouraged in our faith today by remembering him? That's what we're talking about today on Kairos with Tom Peach. So, Tom, Martin Chemnitz, who was this guy? And um, perhaps for our uh, non-Lutheran watchers, it's worth noting that this is perhaps someone that they've never heard of before. And maybe even for some Lutherans <laughs> haven't heard of him as well too. He is a Lutheran. He is a Lutheran, uh, the generation after Martin Luther. Um, so he is not known as being Saint Martin Chemnitz because... There isn't the process of mm. canonization in the Lutheran church as much, but there's no reason why we can't call him saint. Him being a baptized believer of God, saint means holy. He was made holy through baptism and through the um, forgiveness of sins, the reception of Holy Communion. Saint Martin Chemnitz, he um, was born in uh, 1522. So um, Martin Luther would have been close to 40 by then. So he was a, a, a young and the next sort of generation. Um, actually, we're celebrating on October, no, November, November the 9th, the 9th mm-hmm. sorry, because um, on, this is a bit of interesting sort of history, but you know how mm-hmm. sometimes people are named after the saint's day they were born yes. on? Yes. This sometimes happens yes. through history. Um, there's a St. Martin of Tours was born on the 11th of November. Martin Luther was actually born the day before on the 10th of November, and they called him Martin of T- Martin because Martin of Tours was the next day. Martin Chemnitz was born the day before Luther on the 9th of November, mm-hmm. and they still gravitated towards mm-hmm. Martin two days later. Probably a kid's born, and you look at the week's saints' days, and you take your favourite. Right. Maybe you can say, oh yeah, right. we'll claim that one. Um, or, or maybe just the nearest significant one. Mm-hmm. So he's called Martin for the same reason that Luther is mm-hmm. called Martin. He's born in the close proximity of November the 11th. Mm. Um, so he's born um, in Germany and, and he's born from a uh, in, in a household that wasn't necessarily an academic household, but he shows promise. He starts uh, studying around the place. He actually um, made it to um, Wittenberg um, in the year, I think, 8, 1545, the year before Luther's death. Mm-hmm. And um, so he's around there. It, he reflects later on in his life that he should have paid more attention to Luther mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. because yeah. he was a young student. He was taken much more um, by Melanchthon and comes under mm-hmm. a lot of more of uh, Melanchthon's influence and um, then than, than Luther. He did go to some of Luther's lectures. Luther would have been old and w- was quite. Um, uh, he had a lot of ailments. Luther mm-hmm. um, had, and I wonder what his lecturing was like in the last twelve months of his life. But um, mm. uh, Chemnitz did go. Thought he should have paid a bit more attention, though. Um, you're right, as most people do about their seminary um, yeah. education too. <laughs> um, and so he then takes a number of positions, including librarian, um, for for a period of time. And he was he loved being a librarian because it gave him a lot of time to write. And he was among mm-hmm. uh, great books. Interestingly, he also was um, involved in an astrology sort of. And, mm-hmm. and um, this was a dimension of theological life at the mm-hmm. time where. Um, astrology and, and cosmology were closely related and um, God made the stars so maybe he's talking to us through them that's right like and that. maybe the stars yeah. themselves are we, we're a part of actually the way nature works mm-hmm. and that we should pay attention to that mm-hmm. and so he was um, yeah this is one of the things he dabbled in but eventually becomes a pastor and then a mm-hmm. superintendent um, as well in um, one of the early Lutheran dioceses um, uh, dukies um, of the time as well but but he's really more revered for his writings yeah mm. so luther dies in 1546 yeah um and for those who don't know the story of the reformation um in detail things aren't necessarily smooth sailing after luther dies to say the least things go a bit um i mean you know luther was such an incredible figure um but he wasn't uh, what, what will we say? He wasn't overly systematic in the way that he arranged his teachings and, and, and his legacy. And so it seems that this created all sorts of problems after his death. And I know that this is in some ways where Chemnitz sort of comes to the fore, isn't it? That's right. And so even Luther found during his life, he was fielding questions about all sorts of dimensions mm. of Christian life. What's this going to mean for this? Exactly. And, yeah. Exactly mm. right. Mm. And, and sometimes he was on top of it and sometimes he wasn't. Sometimes in Luther's style... He writes one thing that doesn't clearly match maybe mm-hmm. what he says, something mm-hmm. elsewhere at times. 
Chemnitz is born with a, or is gifted by God with a systematic kind of brain. And, and he comes and, and a lot of his writings, he um, brings together teaching. He, he clearly puts down a position. You, you can look up in his work something like fasting. You can never do this with Luther. Mm. You've got to look at an index with Luther and look at the hundred places he mentions mm. fasting and try and piece together. Chemnitz, he's got one section on fasting and you can read exactly his, um, he argues from the scriptures in a very Lutheran way, wanting to see the scriptures as a source of authority and then looking at how this then plays out in our life today with commentary on what church fathers have said insofar as that kind of amplifies and helps yeah. us understand scriptures. So, I mean, that, that makes Chemnitz quite pleasant reading if you're that way disposed because yeah, it's yeah. quite um, easy to access and um, systematic. But that also had a strong um, importance for the life of the early Lutherans yeah. and reformers because he was able to help draw together disparate groups who thought Luther said this, but then he said this. And, and it, there was the possibility of the project fraying. Mm. And Chemnitz really brought a, a theological order. I don't, know, don't mean that in a dry sense, in, mm. in a rich mm. sense, mm. Um, to the whole project. So much so that there, a proverb arose, which was, um, there would, we, we would not remember the first Martin if it hadn't been for the second Martin. Or, yep. or there would be no first Martin if it wasn't yep. for the second Martin. That actually... Even if you've never heard of Martin Chemnitz, um, you're probably influenced by him because yeah. we wouldn't have the Martin Luther we have today in many ways if it hadn't been Chemnitz who helped actually um, steer the church following Luther's death. And, um, and, and I mean, the pinnacle of that was in the writing of the formula of Concord. Yep. So one of the documents that Lutherans hold um, in their confessions, the final document, um, was written decades after Luther's death, and Martin Chemnitz was one of the main contributors to this, the formula of Concord. And it deals with a lot of the questions that arose after Luther's death, and Chemnitz was um, a, a great one for sifting through and giving a, a clear Lutheran response that then the formula of Concord is, is signed onto, it becomes the confession of faith of many Lutheran leaders. Um, and becomes the sort of standard for how Lutheran, especially the, how the Lutheran church is not the Calvinist mm -hmm. confession mm -hmm. of faith. Mm -hmm. um, and Chemnitz is, is clear on wanting to um, set this out. And yet his work continues, of course, as well, um, over against Roman Catholic theology in his right. great examination, which is one of his other big legacies, isn't it? Yeah, that is absolutely. So he also wrote a uh, four-volume response to the Catholic Council of Trent. The, the Catholic Council of Trent um, had, um, w had went on over the, in, in the 60s, 1560s, and Chemnitz sifts through all of the documents that come out and writes a very lengthy response, but a, but a very um, interesting response. So he had responded to more Calvinism on the one hand, and now he situates Lutheranism as opposed to Roman Catholicism in um, some very interesting ways. I'll, I'll give you an example, or I'll give you one that I find just, just very interesting. The Council of Trent had said that the gospel comes to us through the written scriptures, but also through unwritten traditions. Mm -hmm. And in teaching some things that didn't have a clear scriptural basis, they would appeal to unwritten traditions. And, and Chemnitz just takes a really fascinating and interesting approach to this. Um, one thing he does is identify eight different kinds of tradition. You know, what do you mean when you say tradition? Mm -hmm. And fascinatingly, he approves of seven of them mm -hmm. and says, actually, yes, there are seven kinds of tradition that are very, very important for Christian living. And there's one then that he rejects utterly. Um, and so, so he does want to actually locate the Lutheran thinking and the Reformation, not as something new that has just sprung up from nowhere, but actually as something that was taught by the church fathers throughout history before the Reformation. Some people, even Lutherans, were sort of claiming Luther is a new thing. Mm. And, um, but, but the confessional documents of the, even before Chemnitz, the ones that Melanchthon and Luther were involved in, stress that, no, that the new teaching is coming from Rome. We, we want to stay in harmony with what's been taught before. Seven types of tradition we affirm, eighth we reject. And that one is when um, tradition says something not in the scriptures and then you bind people to it. Mm. And um, 
just to give you an insight into how Chemnitz works, he, it's really lovely. He, he, he looks at the scriptures and say, God, says God himself in the scriptures shows that unwritten traditions are unreliable and problematic. He, so he traces the writing of scripture all the way back to God. Um, the scriptures say with the finger of God writing the Ten Commandments. Mm-hmm. So actually the first author to write something down was God. Mm-hmm. He gives us a model. Why didn't he just tell it to Moses? Mm-hmm. Right? Because he knew the human propensity to stuff things up, mm-hmm. to twist things around. So even within this early act of authorship, God himself with the finger of God, it says in Exodus mm. 31, 18, um, writes down, write it down. And then in the prophets, you get this also, a, a, a push to write down um, what, what I'm telling you, write, write things down. And then in the New Testament also, there's all sorts of false teaching going around that um, the apostles are drawn to, to write things down Paul talks about the imperative to, of his own writing this down mm-hmm. um, to people. I think at the end of Galatians, he talks about this and other places too. And so Chemnet says, so if, if God, the prophets and the apostles were all concerned to have a written testimony, um, what makes you think 1500 years can elapse of unwritten traditions that have remained faithful um, against the, the scripture's own practice? So. Mm-hmm. He's a very sort of logical, systematic, but really scriptural, pious thinker. And, um, and he, he writes in, in a way that's very convincing, I think, and has helped the Lutheran Church um, immensely in its confession of faith. Mm, mm. Well, thank you very much, Tom, for leading us into Chemnitz today. And um, I'm thinking particularly of, well, particularly for those outside the Lutheran Church, you know, if there's sometimes... Um, a topic that you're wondering, well, what's a Lutheran take on this? It can be frustrating to go to Luther at times or even to the Lutheran confessions, although there are ways of doing that. But Chemnitz is another angle in sometimes. Yeah. You think, you know, what about angels, for example? You can go and you just read this treatment on angels or fasting, as Pastor Tom said from, from Chemnitz. But maybe Lutherans themselves are looking for that sort of thing. Um, and so Chemnitz can be a good place to go. Hmm. November the... 8th. 8th. We remember Martin... No, November the 9th. November the 9th. Yeah. We remember Martin Chemnitz, the second Martin, without which we wouldn't probably remember the first as well as we do. This is Kairos. God bless you. Thanks again, Tom. My pleasure.